Welcome to today's program at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Soltani, I'm the Executive Director of the ACLU of Northern California, and I'm your moderator today. Uh, joining us this afternoon is Julian Castro, uh, former Secretary of the United States um, Housing and Urban Development uh, for, for our country. And he is the author of a new book, which I just read over the last two days, and I highly recommend an unlikely journey, waking up from my American dream. Uh, Julian has served as mayor of San Antonio um, and was the HUD secretary under President Barack Obama. He credits his rapid political success to his hard work and the support and example of his family. Uh, inspired by his grandmother, guided by his mom, um, as well as a close relationship with his brother Joaquin, um, those were integral to his origins uh, and to his path to public service. Uh, Julian rose out of unlikely circumstances in San Antonio um, to become a promising leader for our country. We're excited to have him here today, um, here in San Francisco and in the state of California, the United States of America, uh, to discuss both his past and what's next for him. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Julian Castro to the comments. Thank you all. Thank you. So there's so much to talk about um, in this book. There's so much to talk about in your story. And I actually want to ask you if you could start by talking about uh, your grandmother, Mamo, yeah. um, and her story and how it shaped um, your path to where you are today. Yeah, and thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Abdi, um, for uh, moderating today. Um, you know, Abdi didn't mention that he and I were at Stanford together. Uh, you were one year ahead of me, yeah. and um, you've actually put your education to good use <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, ECLU. We're going to come uh -huh. back to that when we get to page 112. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I started this book in 2013 when I was mayor of San Antonio. And, uh, you know, I feel like a walking cliche right now um, because, uh, you know, I'm thinking about my political future um, but the book was never meant for this timing. Um, I started in 2013, and I wanted to undertake it as a way to tell the story of my family's journey in the United States, starting with my grandmother. Her name was Victoria, but we called her Mamo, from northern Mexico in 1922 uh, with her younger sister because their parents passed away, and their nearest relatives lived in San Antonio on the west side. So they brought my grandmother through... Eagle Pass, Texas, a small border community, and into San Antonio. Uh, she got pulled out of school when she was, uh, I gosh, I guess like nine or 10, before she finished elementary school, and ended up working as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter. Um, she had my mother when she was 32 or 33 uh, as a single parent, and then raised her as a single parent. Um, but worked very hard, you know, and uh, she came into a Texas that still had signs on the storefront windows that said no Negroes, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. Um, obviously, it was very limited in the opportunity that she had for different reasons, not getting schooling and, and because of the times. But when Joaquin and I were growing up with her and my mother, was a constant source of support for us because when my mom was working, I mean, we were there with my grandmother. She was basically like our caregiver for a lot of the time and loved us unconditionally and, um, you know, supported us. And along with my mother made Joaquin and I believe that we could accomplish anything. Uh, and so she was in my, when, when Joaquin and I were growing up, along with my mother, the biggest influence in our lives. In, in your book, you talk about these different points as you're growing up and what your grandmother was doing and going through in that period. And it also captures your recollections of her when she passed away. And if I could just read that, um, you say, I imagine the dusty trip she made across the border as a traumatized, parentless seven-year-old then saw her in my mind's eye moving into a stranger's house, being ripped from school and still teaching herself to read in two languages. 
having a baby with a barely legal man half her age and bringing up mom, a hell-raising civil rights fighter, and then grandkids. Um, this fact of her immigration story and the fact in her case her parents died, you referenced in terms of what was happening, what's happening right now with our country's policies on immigration. Uh, can you talk a little bit, and being from Texas, um, a lot of this is unfolding right there on the border. What are the insights you're drawing from your grandmother's experience and how it relates to the immigration issues today? You know, I start the book out describing a trip that I made in June of this year on Father's Day to McAllen, Texas, to a protest that was happening outside of the Ursula Processing Center, which is one of the centers where they separate families. And, you know, thinking about the trauma that being separated from your parents inflicts upon a child. You know, obviously my grandmother, very different circumstances, but she used to cry, which I write about, to Joaquin and me when she was talking about her mom. You know, she's in her 70s, an older woman, and she would, you know, regularly cry and say that she wasn't allowed to see her mom on her deathbed. You know, I don't know if they had health concerns or for whatever reason, but she was like taken away from the hospital room. And um, how much that affected her her entire life. Oh, I can imagine these children um, the ones who are of a certain age to know kind of what's happening to some extent. And I know a lot of them have been reunited, thankfully. Uh, I think even though those children may have some lingering traumatic effects, but especially the ones that are still separated and ones that may never come to know their parents because of how badly bungled this administration has been. And um, so, you know, to me, that was insightful, thinking through my grandmother's experience. But the other thing that her experience taught me was that when we think about the value of, of immigrants to our country, you, know, you think about the rhetoric around whether people have an education or what skill they have, but you can't just measure it that way. Because no matter whether somebody's been from Ireland or Germany or Poland or China or Japan or Mexico, you know, they come here and they've contributed to the forward progress of the community and of their family. And two generations after my grandmother got here as a seven-year-old orphan, you know, one of her sons was the mayor of the city and the other one was the congressman mm -hmm. for the city. And that's an American dream story. And we need to make sure that those kinds of stories can still happen in our country and go forward instead of what this president is trying to do is take us backward. We're going to come back and talk a lot more about the country. Uh, what I love about your book is that it's actually incredibly intimate. It feels so close. You take us into the bunk beds of the home that you grew up in, the room that you shared with your brother and your neighborhoods and so on. So the proximity is a very close set of members of your family who are very significant, obviously, in your life. We talked about your grandmother, and, and the next person I want to turn to is your mom, Rosie Castro. And she seems like a total powerhouse and a change maker and a movement maker. But could you talk a little bit about her, her story and then how she then influenced you? Yeah, my mom grew up, you know, in that household this, of extended family that my grandmother had um, grown up in. Um, and Whereas my grandmother was not very political, and she was traditional, like I remember when we would go to church, you know, we were Catholic, that she insisted on wearing a veil, you know, like the older generation would. Um, and she just, she wasn't particularly interested in politics. My mother was a child of the 60s, and she rebelled against what she saw as limited opportunity for her, for women, for Latinos, for people in her neighborhood. and. The way that she expressed that was that she got very involved in politics in college as part of the Young Democrats first, and then in the late 1960s, early 70s, as part of the old Chicano movement. Uh, she became the Bear County chair, basically the San Antonio area chair for the Razonida Party, which some folks will remember was a third party 
that basically said that neither the Republican Party nor the Democratic Party is doing enough to address all of the challenges in the Hispanic community. So we're going to go out and elect people that are actually focused on making real improvement. And um, she ran for city council when she was 23 years old in 1971 with a slate called the Committee for Body Betterment. And at that time, like, I don't remember the history of San Francisco, but it's probably a similar history. There were no single member districts. So very few women and very few people of color won those council seats at that time because you had to run citywide. They all lost. Uh, the slate all lost, but my mom continued to be active on different um, women's empowerment issues and Latino issues. And because of that, she took us to rallies and speeches and organizational meetings. And um, that was her politically. I also write in the book, though, about her as a parent. And, um, you know, here's this mom that raises after the age of eight. My parents were never married. They were together for about 10 years. And... Um, after the age of eight, you know, my mom was raising us along with my grandmother by herself. And um, she was a very lenient parent. You know, as a parent today of a girl that's nine and a <laughs> son that's going to be four, uh, I don't know that I would emulate all of it, you know? <laughs> but she would basic. she was very lenient. You know, we would go and take the bus to go watch the mo watch movies. You know, when we were nine or ten years, maybe ten or eleven, uh, she let us watch R-rated movies. We were cussing by the time we were like eleven or twelve. <laughs> you know, we didn't we could eat what we wanted to in the sense of what was around the house. You know, like there was there was not a strict household, and I think it was that way because she had grown up in a very very strict household, and she was trying to make sure that like we could feel more free to express ourselves and to become the people that we wanted to be. But what it did was that it allowed us to develop this internal self-discipline and to do our schoolwork and to, to have a sense of pride in doing well that was more powerful, I think, than if you have to enforce that all the time. You know, there's a, you always need a good mix. I, I certainly don't let my kids get away with everything, but it worked. And, and I write about that in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, having just read the book, there's so much in it that's so rich. How many people in the room have read the book already? Hardly anybody, all right. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, that's why well, I, I hope already. you do. I hope you do. Yeah. yeah. So how many people plan to purchase the book and read the book? <laughs> Hopefully some folks. Oh, come on. The rest of you raise your hands. <laughs> it's a great book. It's a great read. So I, I kind of have this problem right now. It's like, I don't want to give so much away that someone might not want to read it themselves. Uh, but I am going to just point out on the point about the level of freedom you had that you certainly drank a lot of Coca-Cola. Yeah, we drank a, <laughs> I found drank a lot of soda. I found six references to grab a Coke. And uh, we have something else in common, not just where we went to college, but both of us in middle school used to rummage for cans to turn in to buy Cokes. Yeah. Uh, so that Hands was and bottles and yeah. all that. Yeah. Uh, so you just began talking about your brother, Joaquin, and your relationship with your brother is a major aspect of your life, not just because you're identical twins, but you really forged your path together. And that relationship also has changed over time. Could you talk a little bit about your brother and, and how he's a part of your unexpected journey? Yeah, you know, I have a twin brother. Is anybody a twin here? Some folks? Or hopefully you're not the sibling of a twin and you're like the odd woman or the odd man out, you know. <laughs> um, or if you have children who are twins, you know, people will know that it's a, it's a very unique relationship, a very, especially for identical twins. And so for Joaquin and me, there, there was nobody that I was closer to, you know, growing up than my brother because we were always together. We, for a long time, we had bunk beds, and so we slept in the same room. Also, as you walk through the world and you're a twin, people judge you the same way. You're kind of a package deal. Mm -hmm. People think of you, and they co-identify you. And so the, the relationship that Joaquin and I had early on was a very competitive one, and we were trying to kind of forge our own identity based on a comparison to the other person. Right? Like He was the louder one and I was the quieter one. He did better in sports and I did better in school and, you know, um, just 
in different ways, we were trying to forge our own identity and were very competitive in school and sports. And um, one of the neat things about growing up has been that your relationship changes, right? Just like your relationship with your parents is not the same at the age of 35 as it was at 15 when you thought they didn't know anything, right? <laughs> I'm waiting for the day that my daughter doesn't want to be seen with me taking her to school. <laughs> it's coming. She's going to be 10 soon. Um, but by the time, as they say, when you're 25 or 35, you realize the wisdom that your parents do have. Well, with my brother, it changed from a relationship that was very competitive to one that was very collaborative and that we're each other's best friend and, and supporter. And so um, uh, one of the things uh, that I, I did not have in there, but that I think is illustrative of that is that um, after I lost my first mayor's race in 2005, um, my brother, like a few days later, came to my house and he had a little gift for me. And the gift was, you know those books, whatever for dummies, whatever, they must have like a thousand of those now. Well, it was like one of those, but it said, how to be president, you know, like a joke, wow. a spoof book. But I, I saw that as a gesture of him saying, I love you. And, you know, and I believe in you. Um, <laughs> And, and so our, like our relationship has evolved, and that's been one of the wonderful things to see. You should send a copy of that to the White House. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I'll just use it myself, Abdi. You know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that, I'm sure. I. Uh, with your brother, when well, you talked about the freedom your mom gave you, what you and Joaquin did with that freedom is inspiring. And I think it's actually an endorsement of the idea of freedom, that with freedom and opportunity and work, you know, people can go far. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But can you talk a little bit about how the two of you applied yourselves in high school and the secret strategy that you developed? Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, in high school, we were kind of impatient. And um, uh, we had gone to a magnet program that, where we studied languages. So I studied Japanese for three years, and he studied German in the public schools of San Antonio. Um, and so when we got to high school, we weren't going to the high school that most of the folks we had been with were at. Mm -hmm. And we were impatient to get out of high school. You know how they say the high school is the best four years of your life? Well, I didn't feel that way. <laughs> I don't know about the folks in this room. Um, I just wanted to get on with kind of college and everything. And so Joaquin and I looked at the courses, the credit system, and figured out how we could graduate a year early. And ended up skipping 10th grade. So we went from our freshman year to our junior year and then senior year and graduated and told our mom what we were doing. And, you know. yeah, but you kind of did this on your own and only told yeah. her kind of after you had accomplished it, right? Yeah, yeah. like toward the end, to when we knew we were going to be able to do it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, obviously... Like, who does that? <laughs> you know, like, like this, this, this relationship has this intensity and this yeah. closeness that you could dedicate yourself to something like that and then bring it to your mom as like a, a testament of what you did with the freedom she gave you. It's, it's really pretty. Yeah, cool. I'm sure she was glad that we did that instead of going who knows what, you know, <laughs> yeah, on, the with streets, the freedom. on the streets of San Antonio. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk later about, you know, your wife and your kids. Um, but at this stage, you, you know, you go to college. And in this section in college, of all the people that you chose to talk about, there's a kid in our dorm. So Julian's freshman dorm was my sophomore dorm, and you nailed That's it. That's right. We were in the same dorm. Yeah. yeah. And so just by virtue of how accurate that page is, I can tell you that the entire book must be equally truthful. <laughs> <laughs> just the, so you can vouch for the accuracy I, I can, of the camera. If I can vouch for that page, it is an indicator of vouching for the book. I, I can't vouch to your time in San Antonio or your time as like HUD secretary or the time Barack Obama called you to be like, hey, do you want to be HUD secretary? Yeah. I can't vouch for that, but I can vouch for the kid in our dorm who would walk jangling his keys down the hallway. Yeah. Um, 
but you talk about the culture shock of yeah. changing your environment from being growing up in San Antonio to coming to Stanford. Uh, so what were the, and then let's package it with Harvard Law School. What were the things that gave you the support to succeed as you did in a new environment? Well, I mean, number one, I had my brother there. And so I kind of had this advantage that most people don't have because my brother and I both went to Stanford. Um, and I talk about, I write about in the book going the day that we left. I remember was Wednesday, September 23rd, 1992. And, um, my dad had bought the ticket on Southwest airlines, like must've bought the cheapest ticket that you could find because it was from San Antonio to El Paso, I think to San Diego and then it, <laughs> into SFO, you know, like what? we're flying all day. I would never do that. Like I would never get that kind of ticket now. Right? Um, <laughs> These days we're mad when we have to stop somewhere and then get, anyway. Um, but we cried half the way to El Paso, you know, like, because we had never really been away from home. I had been on a plane once before. I had not gone to Stanford, not visited Stanford. Um, we had really not been much away from my family in that little neighborhood that we were in. Uh, and showed up at Stanford. It was a culture shock because I had grown up in this neighborhood that was you know, 85% Latino and gone to a school that was similar. And now I was in a place with people from all over the country and all over the world, different cultures, different languages, different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. You know, I mean, like for a lot of other people that go to college at one of these places, it just opens up whole new worlds. And then we're not even getting to the lessons that you're actually taking in, in class mm -hmm. and the value of that and different ways of thinking and looking at things. Um, but what I also write about is how that influenced this Bay Area influenced my desire to go into public service, you know, and that that was part of it, kind of realizing that there was a value in getting this education in part so that I could go back and use some of my effort to make sure that other people could get the same kind of opportunity. Yeah, your mom had set the example and the circle of people that she was active with planted that, you talk about Professor Fraga and conversations mm -hmm. and the research that you did about voting, about government, about especially urban issues. Um, but you also talk about what you saw in terms of opportunity, both in the Bay Area and then later in Boston. And then when you came back to San Antonio, opportunity and the systems of support is something you talk about, that it's not just hard work. It's also the examples that are available, the support that's available. So that's really kind of the central political theme that I pick up from your book is just the core idea of opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's why I went into public service in the first place. I felt very fortunate that I'd had the, the opportunity in life to go from the public schools to, uh, in, in a, you know, family didn't, didn't have much, a family of modest means to then go to law school, become a professional, go into public service. And at Stanford, what I saw in the Bay Area was a place that had higher education levels, higher income levels, that was more entrepreneurial and ready for the future. And you know, I wanted to do some of that in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And um, that was part of the reason that I went into public service as well. So I talk in the book about that of course, we need folks to work hard and for their families to work hard, but we also need to um, restore our commitment to creating meaningful, meaningful opportunity for everybody in this country. Yeah. So um, this is a good point to turn to a couple of the questions we got. Um, so both in your work as a student studying political science and then having worked in and run campaigns at the city level um, for your races, your brother's races you've been close to, um, presidential campaigns you've been involved in, one of the questions is how do we you know, inspire people to vote? So with voting, there's the suppression of the vote through the law, but there's also a different suppression, which is that people feel so disconnected that their vote won't make a difference. Uh, so I'd love to hear, we have a couple of questions about, you know, what will it take to really increase the way in which people participate in voting, um, especially for young people, Latinos, and others who are historically yeah. um, vote at lesser rates? Well, I think that it takes a couple of things. Number one, um, 
is that you have to connect what you're doing to their lives, to people's lives directly. You know, I think a lot of people don't participate because they feel like it's not going to make a difference one way or another to their life. And then secondly, and related to that, you need to give them something positive that they can believe in that is going to be done. Um, we have our Senate candidate, Beth O'Rourke, in Texas right now. That, uh, <laughs> that uh, you know, I believe has a shot at beating Ted Cruz. It would make my night if Ted Cruz <laughs> <laughs> loses. <laughs> well, I hope to watch Ted Cruz and Steve King go down. Um, but part of the reason I think that he's been successful down there, above and beyond what most Democrats have been able to do in the last quarter century, is that he's been very positive and um, has tried to sketch out this sort of positive vision. And I think that's what people are looking for. That doesn't mean that you don't take on, whether it's Trump or other people, of course, you're going to have to point out the differences. But people want something to believe in. Mm -hmm. And that was why Barack Obama was successful. It's why other people that have been uh, successful have gotten new people into the process. Uh, in addition to that, though, I think there needs to be a massive and sustained effort and investment of resources to register and then turn out, whether it's Latinos or young people. And the problem is that campaigns just do this and they, they got to focus or they're going to focus with their limited resources on the likely voters, right? And if you're not on that role of likely voters, you're not going to get the phone call or the, the door knock. Uh, it's going to take not just the candidates and not just six months before the election, but sustained investment from these nonprofits that invest and others that, that want more turnout to do that. If you did that in Texas, I mean, you know, you could turn it into a democratic state. And it will be a democratic state. Um, it's already trending in that direction, but just like with California, you could accelerate that. Mm -hmm. So speaking in nonpartisan terms for me and asking the question, but you can answer it however <laughs> you want. Um, you know, I, I actually think a lot about this relationship between California and Texas. Mm. These are two states that were both republics for different amounts of time before they, they were part of Mexico, separate from Mexico, joined the United States, so they have that. They both have the border to Mexico. They're the two behemoth states. They both have this rapid demographic change, and California's probably started a little faster, accelerated faster, perhaps, you know, better than I do. Uh, but I majored in biology at Stanford, and there's this concept in organic chemistry called chirality. And I can't demonstrate with the two, but you're, if you hold your two hands up, there you go. The hands are uh, chiral; they're mirror reflections of each yeah. other, but they're not identical. Sure. So California and Texas kind of have this relationship where we have a lot in common, but things are very different. Um, so if you think about the path forward in Texas, what what would be the outlook about Texas's future? You talked about. There are things that would accelerate that. But what, with the way the concentration of population is in cities compared to the rural areas, um, what's it going to take for people to participate equally in Texas? I'll put the question that way. Well, I mean, I think it's going to take that, that massive investment in registering people and then turning them out. But in, in broader terms, what it's going to take, um, I think, is you know, speaking to people about what's possible and painting a vision for a new Texas mm -hmm. and having high quality candidates that are doing that. If we don't do anything, then, you know, the demographic change will impact the partisan direction of the state over time. But if you want to accelerate it, it's going to take resources and a bold vision and great messengers mm -hmm. to do that. And the building up of talent from the school board level, the city council level, the county level, the state representative, and so on, you know, recruiting great people to run and to articulate a positive, bold message. Um, you all have probably heard, but it's common right now in Texas to say that Texas is not a red state, it's a non-voting state. Mm. It consistently ranks as the 49th or 50th in terms of turnout. And that's by design. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've put in, whether it's gerrymandering that discourages people because they think, oh, well, my, my vote ain't going to matter because we already know who's going to win, 
or voter ID, which they know shaves off certain folks, um, or making it very onerous to register people to vote. Yeah. I think there's a law in Texas that if you don't turn in your voter registration forms, if you go out and register somebody within 48 hours, some amount of time that's pretty quick, you're subject to criminal penalty. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, yeah, it's just a whole bunch of different ways to create an inertia. The first order of business when Democrats take back the legislature and the governor's mansion is to start undoing each of those roadblocks mm -hmm. to participation mm -hmm. and to do what places like Oregon and California and others have done, automatic voter registration. Alex Badia is doing a great job here mm -hmm. in, in California. I think pre-registration, things like that. Yeah. yeah. In, in, the, in the book, you talk about a can, a early campaign that your mom was involved in and a woman at the bus stop who asks, did we win? and the act of voting as a collective experience, the campaign is a collective experience. And uh, I just love that anecdote uh, in the book, that idea that did we win this woman at the bus stop? You come back to her story a few times. Yeah. You, you yeah. talk about you know, giving people a reason to vote. And I want to now come to the title of your book. Um, the first title we talked about, The Unexpected and Unlikely Journey, in terms of you know, your, the path of your grandparents, your grandmother, and mom and yourselves. But the subtitle is waking up from my American dream. So what do you mean by that subtitle? What I mean by that is that in each generation, and especially in my mother's generation and my generation with my brother, we realized that it wasn't enough to just work hard or for your family to work hard, that you had to try and push to make your community and society better to keep expanding opportunity so that people could achieve the American dream. And you know, my hope is that my book will be particularly resonant with young people today. I think a lot of young people have woken up to the fact that we have these forces that are trying to take us backward. And whether it's the March for Our Lives activists or folks, or the dreamers that have been so active over the last several years or immigration activists or any number of young activists, I'm very proud of their efforts because I think they have woken up to the fact that we're, on, we're being marched down the wrong path in this country and that we have to push back in hard and smart ways or the American dream is not going to be there either at all or at least for a whole bunch of folks. So that's, that was the idea behind waking up from my American dream. So uh, home is a part of the American dream. And our country has a long history in terms of its policies related to land, to homes, and to capital, which is what we need to purchase those things yeah, and own them. Sure. Um, so here in San Francisco and the Bay Area, as many other places around the country, we have a serious crisis in terms of the affordability of housing yeah. and homelessness. So this is a question. As former HUD secretary, what suggestions do you have for addressing homelessness? So, I mean, we could take up that, that question the whole hour, right? Um, first of all, San Francisco, um, I know, has, has done a lot, has tried a lot. One of the things that we looked at when I was HUD secretary here under the late Mayor Ed Lee was uh, the navigation centers that other, other cities have adopted. Uh, I think maybe Seattle, Portland, or LA. We had a West Coast Mayor Summit to look at the spike in unsheltered homelessness uh, in these West Coast cities. But I think that it's going to take um, investing in a greater supply of housing that's affordable, um, particularly for the, you know, in the sort of policy speak, ELT or, or ELI, extremely low income, basically people that make less than 30% of the area median income, because that's where the biggest gap is usually in terms of housing that's affordable. We need to, at the federal level, increase things like the National Housing Trust Fund, which tries to invest at a very meager level. I think it was only $174 million in its first year um, housing for extremely low-income individuals. Uh, we need to make better use of uh, the low-income housing tax credit to expand that, and our tax system in general to encourage more affordable housing development. Local communities, especially here in California, need to look at, as the legislature did in the last session, by right development. I know that that gets 
you know, very contentious because um, labor and also environmentalists have concerns about if you just let developers go through the zoning process without being able to check them. I know that Sacramento passed uh, a law related to that that goes part of the way of addressing that is my understanding. But the bottom line is that you need to figure out at the local level how you can preserve what's important, protect the environment, ensure there, you know, there's good pay for folks who work on construction jobs, but also at the end of the day, allow more affordable housing opportunity in the community. Right now on the ballot, y'all have Proposition C. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I was going to take a position? <laughs> no, I will actually. Um, you know, I hope that uh, that San Francisco does pass that um, because I think that I I know the counter argument is a couple of things that, that folks are already paying, and secondly, uh, is this going to hurt business? Right. Um, I don't believe that that is going to end up driving business away from San Francisco. First of all, if that was their main concern, they would have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> okay. The, the reason they're here is because of the brain power in this area that cannot be replicated just about anywhere else, maybe in the world. Right? Uh, so these companies like Twitter, mm -hmm. if they were going to leave, they probably would have left. They wouldn't have started here in the first place. Um, they would but go to Texas, to, wouldn't they? Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, in Texas, some companies have moved to Texas. A lot of companies form here in California, too, right? right? right. The California economy right now is doing well. And I have not been one of the voices in Texas that has knocked California. I mean, the, the rap about Texas in California is, oh, you guys over there, everybody is, you know, somehow in the dark ages. And, you know, why would I want to go to Texas and that people don't have an open mind? And of course, that's false. Um, but the knock in Texas about California is that well, everybody's crazy and, you know, <laughs> that, that, it, that you can't afford to own a business and everybody's getting out. And that's not true either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason that y'all have more people than any other state. Right? Yeah. Some so of my best everything. friends are Texan, actually. Good. <laughs> yeah. No, um, but I think that you've got to think of these things, right, in the balance of all of that, and I believe that, that Proposition C tries to address that without being overly burdensome to business. My understanding is that it's only about 400 companies that would be impacted by that. So that's my opinion. I figured that I should give you all that, you know, as somebody <laughs> that's trying to be straightforward, whether people agree with that or not. Um, if that passes, and my hope is that, that that revenue is put to very good use and very effectively. If it does not, then you know, I do agree with folks that say maybe they're not for this, but there's another way that people can compromise and come up with something that addresses the issue. What I'm glad to see is that there does seem to be a willingness to churn through this and to look at positive ways that we can address mm -hmm. it. And you know, I applaud the people of San Francisco for doing that because I did see during my travels at HUD, a lot of places that just put it off and put it off and, you know, even places that are seeing the spike in unsheltered homelessness, mm -hmm. y'all have chosen not to do that. And that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Um, you talk about your travels for HUD and earlier you talked about the uh, plane ticket your dad got you through four stops. Yeah. But I was happy to <laughs> read that when you were at HUD, you continued to fly coach. So even if yeah. so even yeah, if you were... I, my dining set was pretty cheap too, you know. <laughs> yeah. I write that in the book. Yeah, yeah. You, it was you... fine. I mean that dining set was fine. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you didn't pay for an office remodel? No. No. There was some new furniture. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, usually but yeah, it wasn't a thirty one thousand dollar dining set. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's talk about HUD. You know, it's a huge agency. I've been just reading about the history of, you know, the overt racial discrimination in our co country's housing and housing financing policies that create this legacy of concentrated poverty, racialized concentrated poverty, uh, while things like the GI Bill helped create a lot of assets. Um, and wealth um, for white families who could move to homes that appreciated in value. 
And there's this theme about this idea of the relay and how we pass things forward and assets are a thing that we pass forward. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit about just the magnitude of the challenge when you think about the United States of America and these issues of economic inequality, racial inequality, and the tools of government. Like, can we have faith that we can tackle and make some progress on some of these issues? I think so. I mean, look at our history. <clears throat> at HUD, we had uh, authority over the FHA that basically is an insurer of mortgages for families of modest means. Um, and when the FHA was created in 1934, I mean, basically it sanctioned redlining. It was part of the problem. Right? And it would not insure mortgages to African Americans or people of color. And um, today, between 40 and 45 percent, I think now, of first time African American home buyers get an FHA insured mortgage. So it's a, it's a wonderful um, tool to be able to provide housing opportunity to folks who are responsible borrowers, who have a great repayment rate, who are living up to their obligations, and that in the past were X'd out. Right? And so I think that's a model for the government working with the private sector in a productive way to provide housing opportunity, and that we need to look for more ways to do that. Um, I just say that I think you know, sometimes in the media narrative after the 2016 election, like we set up this false dichotomy between economic issues and racial issues, racial justice issues, that oftentimes those two things go together. And, and the intersectionality of that with gender issues, and I don't mean to say that there aren't issues that are particular. What I'm saying is oftentimes those things run together in people's lives and that we need more policymakers, whether they're taking it from a conservative perspective or a progressive one that are willing to think through how we can effectively um, address those through policy. And, uh, you know, listening to myself, it's crazy talk today to be thinking, saying, you know, policy that is nuanced and this, I mean, these days we just <laughs> like to get through a presidential speech <laughs> that yeah. seems like it has any kind of policy behind it. You know, but, uh, but for the folks in Congress and the folks in state capitals and at city halls that are serious about good, impactful policy, I think there's room to understand and to compromise around how we can deliver that in ways that, that ameliorate the problems that we've had uh, on racial terms, economic terms, and so forth. One uh, policy initiative you talk about in the book was the, the significant progress on reducing veteran homelessness. Mm -hmm. What Now, it's not like we ended it, completely, completely, but actually significant progress was made, and I was very happy to hear, read about that. What, what was done, and how did you make the progress? Yeah, and, uh, you know, I mean, that was a multi-year effort, and so I don't, you know, and in the book, I said that I don't want to take credit. Uh, I was part of the effort, but President Obama set out a goal to end homelessness in the United States in 2010. It was called Opening Doors. That was the blueprint beginning with veteran homelessness. And so this was an example of Washington working the way that it should. The president had a vision. The executive agencies were charged, especially HUD and VA, with administering vouchers to veterans that were homeless. Um, they worked with local communities, including here in San Francisco, through the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness, uh, where local officials did their best to adopt best, best practices and to push their agencies to, to go and find veterans on the street, create by name lists, set up the systems that they needed to be in place to effectively reduce and eventually end veteran homelessness. And between 2010 and 2016, there was a 47% reduction in veteran homelessness. Mm -hmm. So almost cutting it in half. I mean, that is government the way that it should work. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot of lessons there. And so I'm hopeful that you know, when we have in the future, when we have an administration that is actually committed again to this work, that we'll be able to apply those to family homelessness, to chronic homelessness, to youth homelessness. So I'm going to pivot a little into the political side. And so here's a question. How did you feel being considered for vice president in 2016? 
Oh, you know, of course, like everybody else that was considered, I was honored to be considered. Uh, I just, and I write about in the book that it's just a weird process. You know? I mean, because the vice presidential selection process is unlike anything else in American politics. If you think about it, in American po in politics, usually I, if I'm trying to get elected, I go out to y'all and I'm giving you my pitch and why you should, uh, why you should vote for me. It's public. But in the VP process, you're, you know, when you're pitching in politics to the voters, in that process, you're pitching to one person. Mm -hmm. And more than that, you're supposed to pretend that you're not even interested, <laughs> you know, that, that there's no vetting going on, right? Like, what? You know, just, I mean, I guess, you know? And that, this is not to say anything of the can. I mean, Hillary was fantastic. She was great. I'm just saying kind of the tradition of it is, is a little bit ridiculous, right? Um, they gave me a 129 question survey to fill out. <laughs> and, and I spent hours with the lawyers, a team of lawyers, and the lawyers for each of the people that were being vetted, seriously, they produced these two binders, everything about your personal life, your financial history, your public record, the negative you know, research on you and uh, had to go get a blood test and a physical to make sure that I'm fine. Uh, you know, I thought I might be able to skate by only being 41 at the time, but no. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just an interesting, but I say in the book also, you know, if you all read it, that, that I could tell by the end that I wasn't going to be the nominee or wasn't going to be selected mm -hmm. and, um, and reflect a little bit on that. Do they let you keep the binders? <laughs> You know what's interesting is that I asked, I saw the guy, one of the guys that, was in, that did the stuff, the lawyers, and I asked him a couple weeks ago, hey, where are my binders? <laughs> like, I may need them. Yeah, because that's like <laughs> opposition <laughs> research and yeah, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. I want the binders. Yeah. <laughs> so what might you need the binders for? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just good to have. It's good to have. <laughs> You know, actually, at our office, we have like stacks of empty binders, yes. but you're interested in the content. And not of the binders, binders full of women like Romney. No, <laughs> no, no, no. We all remember how bad yeah, that was. That was really bad. These were my binders. Binders yeah, yeah. full of me. Yeah. 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 So let's let's turn to the future. And what are the ideas you have for your path, the next steps in your unlikely journey? Well, I'm going to make a decision about running in 2020 um, after November 6th. And, um, you know, whether I run or I don't run, what I'm convinced of is that the American people in 2020 are going to support somebody who represents um, a positive vision for the future and somebody that's fundamentally trying to bring the country together mm -hmm. instead of to tear it apart. Somebody that... Yeah, I think that they're going to go with somebody that they believe has integrity instead of what we've seen. Mm -hmm. And somebody that is committed to expanding opportunity in our country for everybody instead of picking and choosing who gets opportunity based on what your religion is or, you know, how much money your folks have or don't have or anything else. And I also believe that people are ready for a new generation of leadership. Mm -hmm. And whether... Whether that is me or that is somebody else, I mean, y'all have uh, here in California a wonderful senator, Senator Harris, that also represents a new generation of leadership, and you have several other people. So I, I disagree with people who sometimes say, you know, that we don't have a good bench. Like, we have a fantastic, talented bench of people out there. And yeah, you know, nobody has been on the same platform yet, as a presidential candidate, but that's part of the process. You know, people will be, whoever those folks are that run and whoever becomes the nominee. The last thing I'll say about that is that coming out of 2016, of, there was bitterness, of course. I mean, that's an understatement, right, within the Democratic Party. And I believe that having a lot of people run, having all these debates where the candidates can articulate their vision for the future and you know some are going to be more conservative and some are going to be more liberal within the democratic party people can hear and judge like they always do who they agree with the most who their candidate is that is going to be cathartic we need to go through that in 2020 
And that's going to help the party, I think, to heal. And the, the eventual nominee is going to be stronger because of that. So I look forward, you know, if I get into it, if I don't, if I'm just cheering on the folks who are on the stage, that process, because I think it's going to be good for the Democratic Party. So I just pulled out my pocket constitution. <laughs> and I have three of my coworkers who just started laughing because they were just waiting and waiting. Like, when's he going to do it? When's he going to do it? In so a you moment, have a reputation. By yeah, yeah, yeah. In a moment, we're going to talk about my favorite amendment of the constitution. But right now, I'm going to go to Article 2 of the constitution. And this is who can run for president. And it says, no person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this constitution. So let me just note, back then it was okay to be an immigrant citizen and run for president, but not after, like not now. Shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. Okay, so you're definitely over 35 years old, but when you say a new generation, it could skip to the millennials. So that'd be interesting, like when will the next first millennial president come? Um, but that's, that's yeah. in the generational issue. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true, 35, that's, yeah. I will note in the earlier part of Article 2 is the first and only place in the Constitution where the pronoun he is used, actually. It's interesting. Mm. The Constitution is pretty gender neutral, except in that little one spot. Uh, but that's not what we're here for. <laughs> uh, so let's go to the uh, 14th Amendment. It provides for all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. And this July 9th, uh, which was the anniversary of your swearing in at HUD a few years earlier, but July 9th is a good day to remember, was the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment. And this is the relationship of states and the United States government, the principles of due process and equality. Um, thinking about Texas, thinking about our 50 states, thinking about the Republic and where we are in that moment, what is your hope for the United States of America? We've been through periods of division like the Civil War and we have come back together, United States of America. Yeah. Well, my hope is that we will be able to summon our better angels like we have throughout history. Right? I mean, we have had uh, you know, terribly dark, divisive, violent even times, the Civil War, you think about uh, Jim Crow, um, the division during the Civil Rights Movement and the turmoil I mean, this news today of them catching that suspect on the mail bombings. Well, those of you who lived through the 60s and early 70s remember that that wasn't very uncommon right, to have bombings during that time. And so, but at each stage, like if you chart it, okay, well, what has really defined the United States? You know, there are the words in the Constitution that, that set these ideals we, never have, we have never completely lived up to our ideals, but you always had you know, the prevailing wind of people who were committed to improving, to getting closer to the ideals of the words. And the question right now is, are we strong enough? Do we have enough of those folks who are committed to continuing to push forward toward those ideals? My hope, like I'll give you, you know, we, talk, we started off talking about the Ursula Processing Center. My, one of the things that gives me hope that that's true, for instance, is when I went down there, I saw people that don't look like me that were also down there protesting for these little kids. That we can get beyond a lot of the division around the color of our skin or where we come from or other things and get on to acting based on these values that we have continued to try and strive for. I still think that we can do it. Like, I believe that we can do that. Well, here's one. Do you believe that the democratic 
president in 2020, if elected, will be able to heal the current divide in our country? And what specifically in your life would you use to be that president who would heal us? I do think that that's possible. I think that it's gotten harder. What's gotten harder to do is to summon this common sense of purpose, this common sense of national identity and purpose. And the problem is that that's getting worse because we have a president right now, in my opinion, that, that exploits division for political gain, creates fear of people, puts the blame for things like this violence on CNN or the media or other people, instead of rising above that and trying to be as big a leader as the White House requires. So I'm hopeful because if we make a leadership change, I think the first thing you're going to get, no matter who the next person is, that I doubt you're going to get somebody that's as irresponsible as the current president. And the next person will likely be able to rise above more than this president has. Uh, in terms of my own experience, um, you know, I've, I've always, during my time in public service, tried to bring people together. In the case of my service in San Antonio, tried to bring them ar together around a common vision for improving achievement and ultimately prosperity in the city. Or at HUD, you know, there are a lot of people when you talk to folks out there that blame poor people for being poor. You know, for living in public housing. And I always tried my best to be a kind of bridge to paint a vision of our country that included people who are poor, people who live in public housing, and everybody else together. And so, but I think, you know, I'm confident that no matter who the next president is, that they're going to be a lot better at bringing people together than this leader. So we're bound, you know, with leadership change to come together more as a country than we have over the last 18 months. And I, I, the last thing is, I don't think Barack Obama gets enough credit for what he did with that, you know? Uh, because he did try to do that, um, but I don't, think he, I don't think that his efforts were recognized for as much as he tried to put his hand out uh, to you know, reach out for common solutions and compromise. So <clears throat> I work for an organization that's nonpartisan and that doesn't endorse or oppose candidates. And I'm wondering, as you think about partisanship, if, you know, the question that's posed here is, how would you make being bipartisan cool again? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't get the sense that with, with regular folks out there, that it ever became uncool. I think that in certain hyper-partisan parts, you know, with our parties, that it has been looked down upon. But I think even people that are very progressive, people who are liberal, like, I don't think they oppose the idea if you can strike a deal on something of doing it to be effective. Um, you know, I do think that, that there's some folks who see that as a negative, but I don't see it necessarily as uncool. I just think that people have gotten into their camps in D.C., and then that starts to influence people around the country. But there are examples even now of people working together in Congress that are Republican and Democrat on issues and you know, who have set a blueprint for how we can do that. And so it actually doesn't... that. I am concerned that we seem a lot more polarized, but I do think that there's still an opportunity to work together. Yeah. Um, you talk in the book about how we're actually more alike than we are different, whether it's by party or by place or any of the things that normally divide us. And um, you know, thinking about presidents and the history of presidents, uh, you talk in your book about LBJ um, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I'm just interested in what you think will be some of the big issues over the next six to 10 years. What would be the next major strides forward for the country if you consider at the scale and magnitude of some of those achievements? Yeah, well, I think continue to expand opportunity and freedom, right? In the last decade, for instance, the fact that we got marriage equality 
was a breakthrough in our country. I don't think a lot of folks would have seen that coming 15 years ago, right? Or even 10 years ago, maybe. Um, addressing climate change, which is an existential issue. So a big part of the next few years is going to be getting back on track. Mm -hmm. As folks will know, you know, the actual legal date to be able to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, I believe, is the day after the election. So it's not going to happen, in other words, in 2020. Um, but addressing climate change, these, these long-term challenges that we have, addressing the quality of our public education, because I do think that a lot of the, I guess the best way to say this is that it's easier to divide us when we have a weaker public education system, yeah. mm -hmm. right? The weaker our public education system, the easier it is to put people into camps. When people gain knowledge and when they learn about each other and they learn about ideas, they become, I think, more tolerant, mm -hmm. more appreciative of differences and how we can make that a positive instead of a negative. So, you know, a renewed commitment to public education um, a commitment to figuring out, uh, as many are studying right now, especially in Silicon Valley, the future of work. You know, as we get driverless vehicles, as we get these, you know, the sharing economy jobs that don't have benefits. I mean, look at the difference between a Lyft or Uber driver and a taxi cab driver, or you know, even a taxi cab driver. Those are independent contractors, or you know, somebody that drives for a company. All right, we're going into this this phase where more people are going to work either self-employed or otherwise, but they don't have benefits. You know, we need to address that. Um, that's why you see things like the jobs guarantee and a stronger push for universal health care, because if employers are going to step out of that, then we need to go to another model, ultimately. Right? And if more people are self-employed, they're essentially small business owners without the wherewithal to just go into the market and get health insurance, and we better make sure that we have that safety net there. That's going to be more important than ever, and rebuilding it ought to be a priority. Uh, we've come close to the end of our time, and I want to just use this uh, final period to say a thank you from those of us who live here in the San Francisco Bay Area. You talked about your um, family, the previous generations, but your wife Erica, your daughter Karina, and your son Christian are your, your kind of your immediate kind of family. And I want to give you a gift uh, about one of the heroes of the San Francisco Bay Area's uh, fight for equality, Fred Korematsu, oh, of course. Yeah. who challenged Japanese-American yeah. internment. And uh, there are many heroes in Texas, uh, and this is one of our heroes from California. I just want to give this to you and your family. Thank you very much. Yeah. A wonderful man. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, you probably already have many, but I'm going to give you a <laughs> pocket constitution. But and, uh, this, put that right in my office, Abdi. This is a special will, pocket uh, constitution. <laughs> we reprinted it with a commemoration of the 14th Amendments. Uh, anniversary, it's 150th anniversary. So this is a pocket constitution. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to give you an opportunity to share any closing thoughts as we bring this program to its end. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much, Abdi, and thank you all, everybody that came out to the Commonwealth Club, to the folks here, the staff. And uh, just to say that uh, I know that a lot of times these days it can seem a little bit dark and divided. Uh, I can't remember a time in my life more where I've heard people say that they don't watch cable news anymore because they just don't want to deal with it. But now is the time for all of us to lean into it and to espouse um, the values, as I said, that have made this country the special place that it is, to stand up and to fight for those values. We have an opportunity in 11 days to do that. I have no question how California is going to vote. But uh, I hope that folks here will take uh, these 11 days for those of y'all that uh, have families in other places to encourage people to participate. And um, I wrote this book in part because I wanted to communicate, like convey to the younger generation, the things that are possible 
And so I hope that in our actions, in our words, in our deeds that we're going to convey to the younger generation the, how special our country is and that they need to help keep it up and that we'll be a part of that as well. Thank you very much. So there's, um, there's books outside and there'll be book signing outside. And I'd like to thank again Julian Castro from the great state of Texas mm -hmm. and the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is now adjourned. The place where you're in the know, the Commonwealth Club. Have a good day. All right.